hey guys so it's day 30 something no 40 something no possibly day 50 something of this lockdown i don't care anymore i don't care what day it is anymore i just know that we are here we're in a lockdown i don't want to hear about the levels anymore until we're at level one i'm actually have no interest so i've made key decisions that i won't take interest in particular things anymore in order to survive this what i know now is that i've reached that point where i don't want to count the days anymore i don't want to think about the cases which mind you are surging yes i'm well aware that they're now over eight thousand, but i want to be like in a bubble in a cocoon i don't want to look at the days i just know that we are here and i want to get through it but it's also very difficult to do that when you see the images that come out, out of one particular province that i'm about to write off yeah. yeah 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 i'm about to write off the western cape i've decided that south africa now has eight provinces because the things that i'm seeing in the western cape are bugging me I would like the government to consider allowing us to surf instead of walking on the road with everybody else. I don't think it's any more risky than going to a walk or for a job. Thanks. Paddling or surfing is really very good social distancing and I think it would make a difference. The walkway is absolutely packed this morning. Tanti, what's not clicking in the Western Cape? What is the disconnect? Are you guys not receiving the same figures and information from government as the rest of us? Why are you continuously breaking the rules? Huh? Why can't you just comply like the rest of us? We all want to go outside, trust me. I want to go hang out in the park, you know? We all have things that we want to do, activities that we want to do, but know that we can't do them as yet because we are in the situation. We've got to comply so we can get out quickly with the minimal amount of damage but no 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 you are not doing that and yes guys but i do get it i get that government is sometimes frustrating we are all experiencing just claustrophobia on so many levels but the constant antagonizing of the police constantly complaining about the most minute things like the tiniest most irrelevant issues that's not getting us anywhere that's not moving us forward we need to move the needle forward we need to try beat this thing we need to have the least amount of damage to our people our economy but you gotta play ball guys we've all got to come to the party i'm afraid we've got to plan for the worst uh, and uh, we are informed that the worst is still coming we are going to get more uh, people infected but the important thing is that we, we need to ensure that we lessen the pace through which these infections are going to take place. And then over and above that, then you've got these rising figures of the coronavirus um, being confirmed in the Western Cape. And then we are told it's because you test the most. You don't test the most. The Western Cape government is lying. You don't test the most. Gauteng tests the most. That's not why those numbers are happening. I think those numbers are happening, again, because the province is too focused on being critical of national to do what it needs to do for its people. This is why I'm writing off the Western Cape. Because you are lying. You don't seem to understand what is actually happening in your own province or what's happening with this virus. Guys, no, man. It's actually unacceptable. <laughs> Another unacceptable thing, the Zoom is trying to make a comeback and take advantage of this period. Now is not the time. Now is not the time for you, Duduzani, Zuma, to be telling us how you would treat this pandemic. You've never been head of state. I believe that a full lockdown of, of South Africa was, was a bit premature at that time. Um, for the reasons of the outcome. The outcome was always going to be exactly where it's leading up to. You know, people are sitting, we've pushed them to a corner and we're not, we're not giving them an opportunity to, to, to come out of it. Now we'll be surprised when people react the, the, the way that they do, but we've given them, we haven't given them any other, any other chance to do anything else. So now that speaks of an unrest that has already started in, in pockets. I'm not saying that it's going to lead to an unmanageable situation, but chances are it could because people have got families to feed. We all have families to feed. You know, we're sitting here, we, we are able to, 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 to converse via a video call um, and, 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 and probably have something to eat, food on the table this evening. But how long will that last for? Because a lot of people do not have um, the, 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 
the positioning or, or social standing that some of us might have. Duruzani Zuma has now started a YouTube channel. He's now a YouTuber. Yes, you can create your own content whenever the hell you feel like it. And on the channel, he speaks to his father about a variety of issues. They speak a lot about the deputy president, uh, Dabede DD David Mabuza. They speak about his mother's passing, uh, Kate Zuma, who had committed suicide, I think in 2000. So she becomes part of the conversation. They speak about Reverend Meshwe. And then my best, <laughs> the cherry on top, was hearing former President Jacob Zuma speak about Nazrek and the money being used. I wonder if we should take him back to 2007, Limpopo specifically, Polokwani conference, where he became the ANC president against the wishes of many, including his predecessor, former president, Tawumbeki. And let's ask people about what happened to money then. Hmm? Should we find archives of now health minister William Kiza speaking about what he used to do for you? and how the system is rotten in the ANC and was perfected to get you where you wanted to be? Now's not the time, eh? Now's not the time. No, 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 no. Hasena ako. It's not the time. I don't know. It's, I just don't have the pay, patience for cheap politicking. And that's what that is. I'm very much interested in the story of former President Jacob Zuma in his own words. But not this. This little gimmick that they're pulling on YouTube with his son. I never thought that the Zumas would be a talking point during the COVID-19 outbreak. And I didn't see it coming. If it's not Turizani that we're talking about with his father on YouTube, it's Dr. Nkosuza Nadamini Zuma and these random attacks, these unwarranted attacks that she's been dealing with. So to help us chat a little bit around some of those issues, most of the politics of it all, I've invited Comrade Q. Our new politics editor here at News24 on the 8th episode of One More Thing with myself, T.D. Madia. The exciting thing about this week is I almost go back into the world I know so well and a world I find comfort in. You know, I go back to politics. And not only do I do that, but I also introduce you guys to a new voice that's joined News24. Our new politics editor joins me now, obviously via virtual platforms. I have been complaining every week that, um, you know, we're doing things from closets. I'm recording the podcast in my closet. So I now speak to Kanita Hunter, Comrade Q, or some know her as Mzaga, Zaga, 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 how are you doing? I'm very well. Thank you so much for having me on this podcast. I'm very glad you've joined. I'm glad you're working with you. I'm glad about the future and, you know, navigating politics together. I mean, we know each other from the field a lot and we chat a lot about, like, just the difficulties of, of covering politics, as I call it. And the biggest story that I think we've been dealing with is this Dr. Nkosa Zanadlamini Zuma story and how... She is this renegade, this rogue minister who sat in a study and decided to adopt all these uh, regulations and gazette them all by herself without the amazing uh, Silda Maposa, who means well, who does well, and who can't be touched, you know? What do you make of that, that, that whole scenario and the narrative around it? Siri, I think that, you know, taking it a step backwards to the politicking around COVID-19, obviously that was inevitable in some way, in that, in that just in South Africa or in the world, politics has found its way at the center of, of the pandemic. So it has become less about a public health crisis and more a um, political issue with, you see elsewhere in the world, uh, growing um, authoritarianism, uh, attacks on, 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 on freedoms, etc., um, and just failures of the state. So politics is central to Corona-19, regardless of where in the world you are. So that's just, you know, one thing to put out of the way. Now you bring it closer to home and you see the regulations that government has been imposing under the state of national disaster um, to, to, to sort of help curb the spread of COVID-19. And we kind of forget that in the euphoria of the actual regulations, that there's a purpose to this. There's a reason why there's a lockdown that government has implemented four stages of the lockdown, or no, five stages of the lockdown. We're now in stage four, coming from stage five. And that, and that uh, part of the, those regulations is one controversial element, which is the ban on the manufacturing, the sale, um, uh, and the sale of, of, of tobacco products, including cigarettes. And then you have this kind of uh, mini battle that's going on 
that Cyril Ramaphosa is the savior of Corona uh, uh, virus and and um, the savior of South Africa during this time, and he's dealing with this nemesis and this arch enemy and this um, devil incarnate called Kosazana Dlamini Zuma, and I think that that's where things go downhill. To put two people against each other without the relevant information or any background or any any real briefing to say actually this is how it unfolded in um the uh, you know command council meetings or in a cabinet meeting there is no premise to say that these two were actually at each other's throats and Kosazana won this fight it is it is a presumption to just continue with this euphoria that says Ramaphosa will always be the good person um quote unquote and that if anything goes wrong it's 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 his opponents. Why is that happening? Why have they taken us back to Nazrek? And of course, when I refer to Nazrek, as you know, I speak about the ANC battle where these two went up, went up against each other for the ANC presidency, which was, of course, won by President Sol Ramaphosa, who went on to become a head of state. But he then appointed Dr. Nkozana Dlamini Zuma as a member of his cabinet. The one struggle is that we have in South Africa is some people are refusing to leave the Nazrek conference. They still have a hangover from 2017, and it's playing itself out now. Why is that still happening? I think that is a very important thing. I don't think people can let go of it very um, uh, quickly because it, it obviously played an important role in the shifting and redefining of South African politics. So I think to a certain degree, um, you know, just like Polokwane did for many, many years, just like Mangawung did for many, many years in 2000, you know, from 2000, in the 2012 ANC conference in Mangawung, um, is that, that the, the, the result of that conference really redefined politics. You can, one can argue that it redefined opposition politics, for example, and you see the weak state that the opposition parties are in as a result of that, the outcome of that ANC conference. So, this, so, I, so I think to a large degree, um, you know, the, the dynamics that unfolded at that conference was obviously unprecedented, where you didn't have a clear winner. And so, so that type of, of analysis sort of paves its way or finds its way trickling through different um, elements of political discourse. The reality of it is that, Tzidi, the the benefit of the doubt or this euphoria was an advantage or a luxury extended to Cyril Ramaphosa when he became president based on absolutely nothing but goodwill. South Africa had reached rock bottom and people were left without any hope. And so the belief that this man was going to fix it all. So it was that blind euphoria, that blind loyalty that this man alone can fix it all. You know, Konita, my whole argument has always been, even if you wanted to paint Dr. Nkosana Dlamini Zuma as a role character within that cabinet, there are basic steps to be followed. There are basic truths that you can't avoid. The truth of the matter is, she does serve at the behest of the president. She is a member of cabinet. She doesn't sit in a study and gazettes the regulations as she pleases. Those will be determined and approved, really, by the head of state. Those things are basic things. Constitutionally speaking, those things are basics. And those who want to paint a different narrative, it goes against the truth, objective facts. So the reason why I giggle a little bit when you speak about the administration, Kwanita, is because I also am a little bit obsessed with watching the members of his administration. And I often find that that's where their own goals lie too, you know. Um, you've got a Tito Mboweni versus an Ibrahim Patel on the issue of uh, funding and SMME support. Should it be on BEE lines or should it not? We know that very often they speak past each other, they speak different languages, uh, to, on the, whatever the issue is, you know. I was actually going to ask you, I was wondering rather, I was wondering who are your heroes and, and, and complete failures in this, you know. Two weeks ago, three weeks ago, I thought I had an issue with the two Lindiwes. I thought Lindiwes and Zulu and Lindiwes Zulu were very problematic. I've since changed my mind watching Lindiwes Zulu as of late. And I wonder who are the, the problematic people in that cabinet who are hindering the president's ability and government's ability to do its job. I, I have long stated my view, Tsiri, about the finance minister. And, and, and let me explain to you what, what is my issue with Tito Mboweni. It's not perhaps Tito's views or ideas, you know, which, which we sometimes agree or disagree with, right? My issue with Tito Mboweni is that he's acting like a child who throws his toys out of the cot 
every time he doesn't get his way, instead of navigating in a way that is, a co um, uh, instead of navigating in a way that is that is um, you know coherent and 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 makes and makes sense. So what you have is is the finance minister, and this is something Ramaphosa also has said. And you and you and you 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 recall that they the both the minister of finance and the president have this tendency of constantly repeating the problem which is something that we never had before so you keep saying um the house is on fire the house is on fire the house is on fire so that people get distracted and not ask you but you are the fireman how are you going to put off that fire and that's what i think that is the most disappointing thing about the finance minister is that yes south africa is going to lose this huge amount of resources um in terms of of tax revenue yes businesses are going to be laying off left right and center yes the economy is going to absolutely tank we know this it's not your job to reiterate what the public already knows your job now is to chart a way forward so even if you are talking about the international monetary fund where is the details on the international monetary fund so there's this political hullabaloo that makes him a victim because oh look at the ret people or the you know his opponents in the anc are calling for his head but there's no explanation as to this is the reason why I fought for a tab against a tobacco ban, and this is the consequences of it. Now that I've lost the fight against the tobacco ban, um, this is what my contingency plan is. So it's almost like a to a child who keeps throwing his toys out. And I mean, you know how many stories you've heard about, you know, Tito Mbueni almost, you know, uh, being okay with the thought of him of being fired, and 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 I think those those kind of petty politics. Should should not be existing um, during this time in the sense that, you know, every time there's a criticism against Mbueni, it's almost seen as if, um, it's almost seen as if he, he you know, he, he, he can't be criticized because he's above criticism. So, Kwanita, where do we go? You know, we're stuck in a quagmire. We're running around in circles. People are getting really frustrated and picking at the most randomest things. I think some of the issues that have been raised are serious issues. I think in some areas, it is important to go to the courts to challenge government. But where do we go? What next in this chapter where we are stuck staying indoors with an economy that's dying on our watch? I think that there is no clarity as to what the coronavirus would mean for both uh, the economy and politics. What I do know, however, is that government desperately needs to not um, take it for granted that communities are just going to comply as they have in the past. And so the most important thing that's, that's necessary in this time is a good communication from government that clearly explains uh, uh, processes, that explains decision-making in a way that can still sustain the, 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 the citizens goodwill and their and their co uh, cooperation because if you if you don't have the buy-in and cooperation of ordinary south africans this lockdown means absolutely nothing and as a result you are just you know really breaking an economy for no reason because you're still going to have a public health crisis and so i think that the most important thing is for government to not go back to its business as usual where it was where it was you know not acting um you know timelessly in response to 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 issues the public is facing um and that type of just nonchalance from government i think this is the time for the state to really to to to, to be kept on its toes we absolutely agree on that it's a very interesting one thank you so much for chatting to us that's Ponita hunter the politics editor at news 24 there's an interesting issue around a a middle, a soft middle, in approach, in adherence, in goodwill, in everything, uh, in, in navigating COVID-19. As I said, that's Kodita Hunter chatting to us about the politics uh, around government and navigating the coronavirus. Now, we usually have my colleague Lisa Katanda, also from the Politics Desk at News24, joining us for the top three with Tandwa, just to give us an overview of the politics that played out and what to expect. She's also not in this week. Hopefully, she'll be back with us next week. For News24, my name is Tidi Madia, and this podcast was produced by Noctula Magnatin.